Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Jump On Air. We're so happy you've chosen to spend a little of your Friday with us as we explore statistics, science, data, and of course, Jump. My name is Julian Paris. I am the Learning Strategy Manager here at Jump Software. And as always, I get the great privilege to be your host for Jump On Air. And it's a really great episode today. And so I'm so happy you've chosen to join us. We're going to be talking about data analysis in science. And we have a really great lineup of speakers who are going to share some of their knowledge and share some of their stories with us. And so we're really happy to have them on. And uh, I'll show the schedule throughout the day just to make sure that we stay on track. And so you know, if you need to drop off, you can always come back and catch your favorite segment. If you need to drop off, remember that you can always rejoin by visiting jump.com slash jump on air. That'll reconnect you to the live stream no matter which device you're on. So take us on a run on your phone, take us up to the kitchen on your phone or tablet. We're always here at jump.com slash jump on air. After the show, we'll be redirecting you to our community pages at community.jump.com slash jump on air. There is where you can interact with our speakers. You can download any of the materials that our presenters share. We'll also put any links that they mention during their segments so that you can always get to that content and don't have to be furiously writing anything down during their presentations. So make sure to visit community.jump.com slash jump on air. That's also where you can watch all of our past episodes. So if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, you have a lot to catch up on. So make sure to visit us and uh, watch what you've missed. Now, just a couple quick announcements before we get started. Next week is again a Monday and Friday week only because we have some special programs. We have a data visualization day coming up on Monday with some outstanding speakers. And then we have a predictive modeling day next Friday, again, with some outstanding speakers. Wednesday, we're leaving open because we have another statistically speaking. And this time it's statistical discovery in modern quality engineering. Hopefully you joined us last uh, Wednesday for our data visualization stat speaking. Uh, this one's going to be great as well. So make sure to register at jump.com slash stat speaking and join us this coming Wednesday from one to three. It's, it's looking like it's going to be a really great uh, panel discussion and a really great presentation. All right, so before we get started, as most of you know, I like to do a little bit of a segment and I'm going to do another. I bought this and I'm going to tell you about it. Uh, as always, these opinions are just my own and I'm not financially motivated here. I have no interest in these products. They're just things I love and I want to tell you about. And this time uh, it was actually motivated because I was browsing Amazon and I remembered from a couple years ago when I was at a talk by uh, Professor Dick DeVoe and he was talking about sparsity of matrices and asked the question, uh, how many different items do you think you people in the audience have purchased at Amazon or on any online shopping and people come up, came up with their guesses. Uh, I wanted an actual answer. And so I went on Amazon and downloaded my entire order history. And it was an outstanding number of different single items that I had purchased. In any case, I had this idea a couple days ago that, oh, it's been a while since I've downloaded that. So if you want to download your entire order history going back as many years as you shopped on Amazon, you could do it at that URL. And I'll certainly post that onto our community page. Uh, I recommend you download the item history. So it gives you the specific items that you've ordered over all that time. And it'll give you a data set, uh, much like this one. I'm showing this one in a window here. Uh, there's something very personal about showing your purchase history. So uh, this is very exposing for me. In any case, I, I put this into a data table and Jump, of course, affords lots of great ways to look at this. And one that I had an idea of using was looking at the category of purchases after I did a little bit of recoding to collapse similar categories. And so this was category simple as a packed bar chart. And there was a couple of things that stuck out to me right away. First, I order a lot of different items on uh, the camera category, which makes some sense. Uh, those of you who watch the program have seen me talk about camera things before, and I find I order lots of individual items that way. Uh, one that I thought was funny was electronic cable. And this was especially funny because my partner Margo always gives me a hard time about how many cables I have. I don't know if it's actually a problem, but this is what my uh, garage or my workshop looks like right now because I was looking for a particular old USB cable and pulled down all the bins. Um, and so that's just a subset of all the cables I have. Um, so she, she gives me a hard time for that all the time. But anyway, I do seem to order a lot of cables. Um, but then I got down to looking at the book section. And when I was hovering over this, uh, just using the graphlets and jump, something I'll show on Monday, uh, something popped out that I thought was kind of interesting, which is that among the book titles, there are some books that I've ordered many, many times. And specifically, this book called A Short History of Nearly Everything. I've ordered uh, the regular paperback six times and the illustrated version three times. Uh, it's not that I just keep losing this book. This is actually my, my favorite book of all time. 
And the reason I've ordered it so many times is I keep giving it away. I'm of the mind that you don't lend books, you just gift them. And so I don't even have a version of this paperback to show you right now because I've given it away. Um, and the illustrated ones are the ones I've sent as gifts. And so I wanted to tell you about this book, and it's appropriate for Science Day because this is probably my, my favorite book of all time, and it's my favorite because of how it talks about science and the huge coverage it does of, of sort of what we understand in science and the people that made science possible. And so just to give you a sense, uh, this is the big sections of the book. We have Lost in the Cosmos, which is astronomy and physics, the size of the Earth, which gets into geology, a New Age Dawns gets into paleontology, Dangerous Planet gets into some chemistry, life itself is biology, and the road to us talking about biology as it intersects with our own development. And Bill Bryson, some of you may know, is a, he was originally a travel writer, so he writes in this very compelling way and talks us through the very humanity of scientific knowledge. And just to give you a sense of this, I'm going to read you my favorite quote from actually the first chapter. Consider the fact that for 3.8 billion years, a period of time older than the Earth's mountains and rivers and oceans, every one of your forebearers on both sides has been attractive enough to find a mate, healthy enough to reproduce, and sufficiently blessed by fate and circumstances to live long enough to do so. Not one of your pertinent ancestors was squashed, devoured, drowned, starved, stranded, stuck fast, untimely wounded, or otherwise deflected from his life quest of delivering a tiny charge of genetic material to find the right partner at the right moment in order to perpetuate the only possible sequence of hereditary combinations that could result eventually, astoundingly, and all too briefly in you. So a really great writer and talks about all of this different uh, parts of science. And so I really recommend this book. And if you have children, there actually is a really short history of nearly everything good for ages, maybe seven to 12, uh, which is you can think of as a compendium to that book. So you can get them interested in science as well. And so highly, highly recommend it. I bought that and I really recommend you do, too, if I have not already bought you a copy. Now, one final thing I'll just mention before I wrap up is I was interested in the last thing I ordered, and it's actually this book called So You Want to Be a Neuroscientist. And so if you do have children or if you have a budding neuroscientist in your life, I recommend you buy this book. It's actually by a friend of mine, Ashley Javanette, uh, who is an outstandingly talented person in lots of different fields. But she's also a professor of neurobiology in the University of California, in San Diego. Um, and so she wrote this book. It's coming out soon. And it talks about sort of the, the things you have to do if you want to get into neuroscience, graduate school and lots of her recommendations. So another thing I bought and I recommend you you buy, too. So that was I bought this and now I've told you about it again. No financial interest in any of these, but things I hope you check out. So again, we have a great show for you today, and I don't want to take any more time away from any of our outstanding speakers. Our first segment is by Phil Ramsey of the North Haven Group and Predictum. He's going to talk about characterizing bioprocesses with augmented full quadratic models and fractionally weighted bootstrapping. Phil, welcome to the show. Okay. Thank you. Okay. By the way, I do have to get that Bill Bryson book. That's impressive. Uh, well, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, joining uh, me today for this talk. I am going to use a jump journal. Uh, you may be able to tell from the title, there's a lot of moving parts to this talk, so I'm going to be very efficient. Uh, also, there is a larger slide deck with more detail, and I'm perfectly happy to share that with everyone, and I, I can get it to Julian so it can be shared. So basically, I also wanted to uh, recognize my uh, good friend and collaborator and awesome scientist, Dr. Tiffany Rao, who is not able to join us today, but this is a small part of uh, work that we're doing together and also some things we're doing with Predictum. So I always like to start by setting the context of why do we need designed experiments? Why do we need predictive models? And I like to start with the world of uh, that engineers and scientists get exposed to in the university, the theoretical world where we know all the functional forms, we magically know all the values of constants in formulas. And uh, Tiffany likes to call that the fairy tale world. And this is the real world where scientists and engineers actually operate. Kind of a messy place, kind of a confusing place. Um, functional forms are no longer obvious. So how do we characterize and deal with these noisy uh, systems and spaces? So basically, that's why, one, we use designed experiments. 
not exclusively, and why we need to build predictive models. And nowhere is this more important than quality by design, but anybody working in, say, like a uh, CMC pathway, all of these concepts are very important to them in many different industries. So basically, you ask a question, how does the system actually work? And it's never going to be obvious in a noisy environment. Well, I need data. So for today, we're going to focus on DOE, but not exclusively. And then we can use machine learning, aka statistical learning techniques, to build predictive models. And the goal in this case is to build models that help us to understand the system. And what do we do with the models? Well, there's three big things. One, insights or illumination, uh, as uh, Dr. George Box used to call it. We want to gain insights. We want to characterize the entire operating space or system. And this is important in quality by design. And of course, we'd like to optimize. Okay. And I'd like to talk a little bit about this idea of building models. I've had two conversations this year with chief technology officers who are under the mistaken impression if you want to build predictive models, for some reason, you have to do designed experiments. And even if you have existing data, you can't use it. Well, that's just totally wrong. In fact, what we're trying to build are integrated models. And by the way, I, I would add the jump architecture really lends itself to integrated modeling. Um, that's kind of another topic. But where do the models come from? Well, they come from designed experiments. They may come from existing data. And in some cases, they may come from theoretical models. In fact, you hear all this hype about digital twins. I hate the term, but I like the concept. Uh, and basically, if you're going to build real digital twins, you're going to have to look at integrated modeling. And I just wanted to give a brief uh, plug to Codebase. That's a database uh, product built by Predictum. It plays very well with Jump because one of the problems, this is another talk, is databases and companies are so disorganized, uh, it causes compliance problems for QBD, and it uh, kind of interrupts the ability to fully leverage data that exists, whether DOE or so forth. So in the end, I'm really interested in building these integrated models, and you're seeing that term used more and more in the literature. So what do we do when we do process development? And one way or the other, I've been doing this for too many years. I won't say how many in many industries. Well, basically, you're creating a process, designing it. You have specifications you're trying to meet for it. You need to characterize it. In other words, I have to understand how this process behaves over the entire operating region, especially for QBD. And I want to optimize. And I'll just say key pro performance indicators. Uh, if you are at a stage in QBD where you actually have critical quality attributes, then, of course, you'd want to characterize and optimize uh, for those CQAs, again, if you have them and you're at that stage. But what is clear to me and always has been, this idea of characterization and optimization is all about prediction, and we don't always treat it that way. And in fact, if you go back to what I think was the landmark paper by Box and Wilson in 1951, where we really introduced the idea of response surface and optimization of processes. And that is where we get the idea of the full quadratic model. I'll just call it FQM. And what is a full quadratic model? Well, it's really a second order approximation to an unknown function or response surface. And in terms of optimization, it's very good. So basically, it's a model that has first-order terms, two-way interactions, and quadratics. And again, for finding optima, it's actually very effective, and second-order approximations are. But here's a problem. When we start to characterize an entire design space, the full quadratic model often is inadequate. And there's a much uh, 
unappreciated, I'm sorry, it's just unappreciated paper by the late John Cornell and Doug Montgomery from 1996, in which they pointed out that the FQM was inadequate for dealing with uh, whole design spaces, particularly biological systems. Frankly, biological systems are so nonlinear and so interactive, I don't need to tell that to the scientists out there, uh, that the full quadratic model just isn't adequate uh, to accurately predict over the entire design space. And again, that's one of our goals in quality by design. So they propose augmenting the FQM with a number of <clears throat> what they called interaction terms, they are, and these are what the terms look like, okay, with these linear by quadratic interactions being most important. Essentially, what this is telling you is the curvature in a design space changes dramatically over the um, entire space. And those of you, for instance, familiar with chemical kinetics, this wouldn't surprise you at all. And so they argued these models provide a better basis for characterization, and I'm going to demonstrate to you that they are correct. But there's a downside. Um, there's a lot of these terms, and this was a, uh, it, in the 90s, this was a bit of a problem. For instance, for five factors, there are 20 linear by quadratic interactions. You may not want to use all of them. In fact, if you fit the entire augmented model, there are two times k squared plus one factors. So for five factors, it'd be 51 terms, but I can't imagine ever wanting to use uh, all of those terms. But even a big central composite design is typically supersaturated for these models, meaning there are more unknowns in the models than degrees of freedom to fit them. But we're going to get around that, and I'm going to show you how. And we're going to use something called fractionally weighted bootstrapping and model averaging to build predictive models. Okay. So basically, I'm going to do focus on designed experiments. I want to build a predictive model. Typically, in machine learning or AI, you need a training set to build the model and a validation set to test the model, and this is validation in a statistical sense. And here's the challenge. In designed experiments, they're efficient, they're information-centric, and you don't have enough trials to form validation sets. In fact, even leave one out, which by the way is a very bad idea anyway, can't be done because you'll change the structure of the data. That's another talk, by the way. But here's a solution, and Chris Gottwald, you know, many of you know him, the Director of Statistical Research and I, uh, gave a talk in Frankfurt in 2017, and what we propose as an approach to predictive modeling for DOE and other areas, not just DOE, and it's called auto-validation. How does it work? Well, I have a training set to fit models, but I actually take a copy of the training set and I use it as a validation set. And people say, hey, you guys are nuts. Well, the secret to this is we apply a weighting scheme. These are uh, gamma weights, typically. Uh, by the way, this is sometimes called generalized bootstrapping in the literature. And the gamma weights are assigned such that we anti-correlate the training set and the validation set in this very much mimics what you actually do in hold back cross validation. And we have a lot of uh, examples. Uh, by the way, I'll mention for those who are interested, Chris and I are directing a PhD student who is doing his dissertation research into fractionally weighted bootstrapping and auto validation. And so far, everything looks perfectly fine. There's, there's really no risk to it. It's an omnibus procedure. Okay. So <clears throat> basically, Traditional bootstrapping developed by Bradley Efren was sampling with replacement. In generalized bootstrapping, you use all the original observations. There's no sampling. But what you do is on each bootstrap, you regenerate the weights, and this mimics the process of building thousands of models. So 
uh, I'm going to illustrate this for you in just a moment. And then what do we do with the results? I've got a table with thousands of coefficient estimates in it for various models that have been fit on every iteration. And by the way, it's completely open as to how you want to build models. You can use whatever algorithm you want. And <clears throat> this idea of model averaging, which I'm a very big proponent of, for one, it standardizes the workflow for building predictive models. By the way, you may not know it, this has been in jump for many, many years. John uh, Saul put it in the stepwise platform. Many people don't even know it's there. I'm doing a slightly different version of it. Well, actually quite different version, but in concept, same idea. Model averaging is a form of ensemble modeling. This is where the world of machine learning is going. So if any of you have done a random forest, a bootstrap forest, or XGBoost, or neural network, you've actually been doing ensemble modeling. In fact, there are two well-known uh, researchers in the life science, uh, Burnham and Anderson, and they have bluntly stated the days of characterizing uh, biological systems with a single model are over. Today, because of all the software we have, we can use many ensemble methods. What I'm going to use model averaging is just one of them. So what I'm going to do is just quickly demonstrate the concept to you. So this is part of an experiment. In fact, let me show you the experiment first. Just occurred to me. And then I'll get into the data. So this forms the rest of the talk, actually. This is an actual uh, experiment studying pDNA, or plasmid production. And with the rise of cell and gene therapies, this has become a really hot topic with a uh, projection of a huge market growth over the next five years. So in this, this is a fermenter experiment. I'm going to use a five-factor, 15-run definitive screening design. Many of you have heard of very efficient designs. I'm a big fan of them. And we're looking at a fermenter. But here's what's unique. We did the original DSD, but separately, and this is a key, a 31-run central composite design was run. And today, I'm going to use that CCD as a validation set. I'm going to model on the DSD, apply the model to the CCD, I know that sounds a little funny, and see how I do. Um, so here is um, the experiment, the original experiment. And I won't get into a lot of detail, but these are the five factors. I know for many of you scientists, this won't surprise you at all what they are. And the response is the pDNA titer for each batch. Okay, so what I'm going to do at this point is illustrate uh, the method of fractionally weighted bootstrapping. So notice the first 15 trials of the training set. Appended is another 15 runs. It's just a copy, but here's the key. Okay, so very clever formula written by Chris that generates gamma weights, and that's what most people use for various reasons who use generalized bootstrapping, but it assigns them such that the two sets become anti-correlated, so the second copy can act as a validation set. So I'm going to illustrate. Here's the augmented model, uh, FQM model. Okay, I'm going to use generalized regression. Again, this method can work very generally. So I'm going to run the model. And this is a Jump Pro feature, but we, we I'm happy to talk offline what you might do if you don't have Jump Pro. But I highly recommend Jump Pro because you're going to have a lot more options. Okay, I'm going to use forward selection to speed things up. Click Go. Okay, and one thing I do want to warn you about, once you start using uh, generalized or fractionally weighted bootstrapping and you repeat this modeling, you begin to realize how unstable many of these model selection algorithms really are. So what I'm going to do in this case, in other words, I don't really trust a single pass through one of these algorithms, to be honest with you. So I'm going to right click, select simulate, again, jump pro feature, 
and I'm going to do some number of simulation runs, and on each run, I'm going to swap out the weights. In other words, we're going to regenerate the gamma weights, and that simulates a new bootstrap sample. And since I only have limited time, I'm going to do just 10 runs. Okay. So this is what the table looks like. Okay. So I have, by the way, if something didn't get into a model, it gets a zero, otherwise you get uh, the coefficient estimate. So what I'm going to do at this point is actually show you the results. Okay. So let me close some of the windows I don't need here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is it will open. Okay, so this is 2,500 runs. This uses GenReg with best subsets, which I happen to really like. Um, in terms of fitting models. And with modern computing power, it's really making a comeback. So I have uh, 41 columns, so 40 predictors plus an intercept. And also on each bootstrap run, we kept track of the root average square error on the validation set. And that forms a set of weights. So smaller prediction error, larger weight. And then what we do from this, we generate a set of average coefficients uh, for each term. And by the way, you can do other things. This is a completely flexible approach. It gives you a lot of information. Okay. So there are my set of average coefficients. So there's 41, including you know, down here, the intercept. So I just plug those in, by the way to the data set, and now I can use it as a prediction formula, okay? So I'm just going to open the data. So by the way, this contains both data sets, and I want to emphasize again, the CCD was done at a completely separate time, and it's quite different. There's my prediction formula, it has 41 terms. And by the way, for comparison purposes, I repeated the whole exercise using a traditional 21-term uh, full quadratic model. So that formula is there. <coughs> so the question becomes, well, how did we do? Well, let's take a look. So I'm going to go back to, to my slides. Okay. So uh, I want to emphasize again, the CCD was done at a different time, different uh, lots of raw materials in most cases, even a, a new batch of the E. coli strain. It was done with some of them were different fermenters and they were different operators. So about as challenging as you can make it. And there are the results. The root average square error or the, the validation error on the CCD is about 67. Okay, which is pretty good. And you look at the actual by predicted plot. Remember, this is a model averaged 41 term model. And I will tell you, I've looked at this data a lot. I've looked at dozens of models. This uh, is easily the best I've come up with in terms of prediction error on the, on the validation set. Okay, and so the question then becomes, well, what happened when I applied it? to this, the full quadratic model. And I can actually show you, I'll just go ahead and use model comparison. Okay. I don't know how well you can see that. So the full quadratic model has 21 terms and its root average square error on the CCD was about 70 and then the uh, augmented full quadratic model, which I call the model average uh, BST, actually outperformed the smaller model. And the model averaging, by the way, does mitigate potential overfitting uh, problems. And it again, it provides, as far as I'm concerned, a standard workflow. Okay, so <clears throat> once I build this model, I've decided you know, that the augmented full quadratic model is predicting uh, satisfactorily. Well, then I can use the jump profiler. 
I can do optimization. Again, here I only have uh, yield, so it's not really a critical quality attribute. And something else I like to do besides, you know, optimization, finding settings to give you highest yield, which may not be what you want to do in practice, but also these variable importance reports, I don't think we use them enough. I mean, especially in QBD where you've got to do risk assessment uh, risk and risk mitigation, part of what this report tells you is which of your inputs are most important, which need the tightest control. I would say all of them, but that's not how the world works. So you can see here that feed rate is an important part of it. However, a point I'll make that's just an optimization, but I'm going to go back to my slides to show this to you. Okay. But what about characterization of the whole design space? Well, I didn't, I haven't done that yet. So again, I'm using the CCD data and that um, augmented full quadratic model. And a jump, uh, honestly, it just has a perfect architecture uh, for many of these activities. And one of those uh, functions that I really like is built into uh, the profiler, and it's called the simulator. And many of you have seen it. So what I'm going to do is, and for this purpose, I'm going to recenter the profiler at the design center. I'm going to assume a distribution for the inputs. In other words, I'm going to say there can be random variation in the inputs. And hopefully from some amount of uh, actual data, I get standard deviations, how much I expect each of these to vary in practice. You may have that. And then another function in the simulator that many people don't know exists is run a simulation experiment. And what Jump will do is generate what we call space filling designs. You can tell it how many runs, don't get too ambitious. Here I've said 256, and I want it to cover 100% of the design space. So what will happen next is a simulation, say like uh, 500 runs will be done at every one of the 256 points. And what you will get from this are a mean, a standard deviation, if you have specifications, you'll get things like proportion out of spec, which is, can be very important. And then this allows you to characterize the, the response surface. So let me see if I can show this to you. I have a little bit of time, not too much. Okay. So basically, what you do is in the simulator, once you've set up your distribution, you can run a simulation experiment. So I don't have time to do that today, um, but that is an important uh, step that you want to look at in terms of characterization. Okay. So finally, I'm going to do an executive summary, but I wanted to point one thing out to you if you're interested. Um, at Predictum, we, we've actually, we're building um, a add-in that will semi-automate uh, a lot of the analysis you just saw, including fractionally weighted bootstrapping, even model averaging. It's in development. We're really looking for beta testers. So if you're interested, you can just send an email to uh, info at predictum com info at predictum.com, and Wayne Levin of Predictum would just love to hear from you. I can assure you that. He's a nice guy. He likes to talk to people. But we are really looking for beta testers. It's still in development, so it's not a finished product. So very quickly, I'll just give you an executive summary. I know I apologize for uh, the content but it's a story with a lot of parts, and I didn't feel like I should just do one small part of it. And again, and this is not new for me, process development work inherently is about prediction of future performance, especially from the viewpoint of um, statistics and quality. Fractionally weighted bootstrapping or generalized bootstrapping with auto validation allows one to build sound predictive models from 
designed experiments. For those of you in biopharma, you should, you, I'm sure you know this, biological systems are highly interactive. You're kidding yourself if you think everything isn't reacting uh, in interacting. Well, it is, whether we can easily measure it or not, and they're inherently nonlinear. Because of this, full quadratic models typically are not sufficient to characterize a whole design space. I highly recommend the interaction models of Cornell and Montgomery. I have a lot of experience with them. You've seen one small case studies. I have some others. I'd get sued if I showed them to you where the results are much even more impressive. And frankly, I suggest model averaging. It's not a requirement to use this method, but it does give you a way to standardize the process of predictive modeling. And by the way, it's been in jump in some form for a long time. And then finally, we showed you a PDNA case study. That is, those are actual experiments and actual results. And I can't say where the data came from, and I can't share the data, but I can talk about the experiment. So that concludes my talk, and I hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. And um, as I said, I'm perfectly happy to share the slide deck that goes with this. Okay, with that, that concludes my talk. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Phil. That was really informative. And I'll be sure to grab your slide deck from you. And we'll also put that email address on the community page at community.jump.com slash jump on air. That will link to your segment. So thanks again, Phil. In our next segment, we have Timothy Gardner, founder and CEO of Riffin here to talk to us about building a new path to scientific discovery with Riffin and Jump. Welcome to the program, Tim. Thank you. Sorry, um, I was fiddling with my controls. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all here today. Um, let me share full screen. Can you see this all right? You're getting my- Looking, looking great. All right, terrific. Well, um, I, uh, looking over the agenda, I noticed that I got one jump to Molly, which uh, that means that it has to be uh, oriented towards new users, non-statisticians, as I understand it, or maybe at least budding statisticians. So I'm going to try to keep my remarks um, uh, out of the weeds as much as I can, although I, I really love statistics. I love jumping. Um, sometimes I can't help myself. So apologies in advance if I dive in too deep. Um, so a uh, little bit about Riffin. Riffin's a company about six years old. Um, it emerged from my own experiences, I'm the founder of Riffin and emerged uh, from my own experiences about 20 years in industrial biotech um, and, a, and for part of that career in academia as a professor. And um, our mission is to try to make science work better, which in many ways is the same mission as JUMP, providing tools to improve our decision making in science and many other fields. And ultimately what that adds up to is shorter and more predictable scientific product development cycles with, uh, in our case, a particular focus on biopharma and biotech. Um, let me illustrate why this is our mission with a, with a story. So, um, Ann Millie, who invited me to the uh, Jump on Air, uh, loved this, this analogy that I provided um, some years ago, so I decided to dig it back up. This is the Vasa. It's a ship in the Wisconsin Museum in Stockholm. It's absolutely fascinating museum and a beautiful ship. For those of you who aren't familiar, I'll tell you the story in brief. Um, this was built by the King of Sweden in 1628 because he was at war with the Poles and he wanted to intimidate the crap out of them. And he wanted to win the wars, whatever wars they were fighting. And so they had some ships similar to this. And the way they built ships in those days was uh, basically empiricism. They, they had rules that they'd written down for how you build a ship, but they didn't have any ma uh, math or models that would really dictate um, uh, how to build a, a variation on that ship. So th when the king ordered the biggest ship in the world, what they did is they just add two, added two stories to the base ship structure. They didn't change anything else. They just made it taller. And they thought that'd be pretty impressive. So then they, they finished the ship. They Put all, they brought 200 dignitaries from around Stockholm. They put them all on the boat and they, sh they launched it out into the harbor 
It, it sailed 200 meters, the wind blew, it tipped over and sank to the bottom. And the reason is because, of course, they didn't adjust the ballast or the design of the ship for the extra weight and all the cannons up two stories above the normal deck. Um, and some hundreds of years later, it's kind of a funny story and we laugh at it and go, oh my God, can you imagine building stuff that way? Well, it's actually not that funny because that's how we still do it today. And I use this well-known concept of the um, clinical develop, well, the uh, pharmaceutical development pipeline to illustrate, which this here shows the approximate stages of pharmaceutical development as they have been for a long time and they were in 2010. And it, it, at this time, it was about $1.8 billion uh, in, on average to put a new drug on the market spread across these stages, as you can see. But even more shocking in some ways is that only one out of nine drugs at this time that entered phase one clinical trials made it to market. And now that has, has worsened to one out of 10 as of today. Um, and if you look all the way up to bona fide targets that are believed to have disease mechanisms behind them, only one in 25 targets actually become a drugged target. With, uh, that makes it to market. And we live with this. There's a lot of folks who say it's just hard, it's biology, it's, it's medicine, it's disease. Um, I don't really fully believe that. And we, in some sense, can't accept that because this is the cost of drug development over those years. It's getting unsustainably high. So it's grown over the past 40 years from about $179 million in. 2013 dollars, these are all adjusted dollars, to 2.6 billion. That's not a good thing, and we can't accept that. What's even worse is that our way of dealing with this is not to say, gosh, what are we doing wrong? We say, well, biology is really complicated, so we're just going to have to try harder. And what we do is we just launch more VASAs off into the world. So instead of launching one, we launch 25 VASAs into the world and hope that if we do it enough times, it won't tip over and sink to the bottom. But that's ridiculous because obviously we haven't done anything fundamentally different to change the game. So when I see this state of affairs, I think, oh my God, what, how could that be? Why, how? There's so many brilliant people working in this industry. How can this go on? And it actually, in some sense, is very, very, um, at its core, I believe, very, very simple. And um, I think many people understand this. And I'll, I'll, I'll introduce my thoughts on this with a game. I, I got this game from Amulya Singh, who is the uh, head of computation at Calico. And we used to work together. And she uses this game to introduce her statistics courses that she teaches from time to time. Um, I'm going to bring it up and jump to illustrate. Um, where we go, there we go. So I'm gonna ask you in your head to think about which one of these observations is bigger. So we've got an observation of something here, we call it E, label E and F. And I'm gonna gradually add more data to this. So if we took a single measurement, this is what we saw of these two things, which one is bigger? you ask yourself that. And then I'm gonna add another observation over time. Uh, let me get my controls here. So there's a second observation, which one is bigger? Now, which one is bigger, do you think? And again, now here's our fifth measurement, replicate measurement, sixth, seventh, and eighth, and ninth. Now I think you probably have a guess as to which one's bigger. Um, we can ask Jump to tell us what it thinks, and it thinks that F is bigger with some reasonable p-value. Um, and the truth of it is, F is bigger. The, the red boxes that I just added were the actual values in this simu simulation. Um, and F is the bigger one. But if we only took one or two or three replicates, we probably wouldn't or couldn't conclude that and generally wouldn't if we're looking at statistics 
But in many situations, people don't evaluate the statistics rigorously, or they say, yeah, it's not statistically significant, but I see a trend in these three points. I'm going to go for it. And that leads to a lot of downstream waste and a lot of downstream problems. Um, and you'd say, yeah, <laughs> nice simulation, Tim, but that's really not how things work in reality. Well, a few years ago, when we were helping a company in the pharmaceutical space, we uh, put in our software and we looked at some of the first data that came back. This was in preclinical DMPK, uh, drug metabolism pharmacokinetic studies. And for the first time, we were able to combine data uh, across their sites. They do drug trials in animals at multiple sites. And uh, this was the same compound with the same protocol using, in theory, the same animals across those two sites. And these are the results they got, got back. They actually got completely different results from the two sites. You might argue maybe they were, they were comparable, relatively speaking, but not necessarily. And moreover, it would be nice if you could actually compare results in an absolute sense across sites. And that just doesn't happen today because of problems of error and the way work is done in, in science and in mass. And it doesn't have to be this way. Again, we tend to use the excuse in the life sciences that biology is complicated. That's why those animal studies look different across two sites. That's why we get all these different results. But I don't think that's true. I think there is non-inherent noise. There is sloppiness in the way we do things. It's contributing more to the bad decisions and the missed opportunities than the actual compl inherent complexity. And the reason I believe that is experience. I've experienced this. Uh, and the first place that I experienced this, well, I experienced the problems as a professor before I entered, went into industry, but I experienced the solutions in industry. And this was a company I worked at where we were, um, it was Amaris, and we were, we were a, a startup trying to build genetically engineered yeast that, um, that could uh, produce a, a small molecule, a compound, an oil uh, molecule from sugarcane. And we had to engineer the yeast pathways to uh, make this ethanol producing beer yeast into something that produced this oil instead. And initially that work went incredibly well. You know, we put in some genes and we got the production of the compound, everybody got excited. And then there was another big jump in performance. And then around early 2008, the company flatlined with about a hundred people working on this pro pro excuse me, this project for many months and nothing was coming out better, just total flat line. And then some folks in our screening group, well, our, our, they weren't in a screening group, they, uh, some folks in the um, biology group decided to change the way we were testing strains. And they brought in 96 well plates, they changed the protocols, they tried to control the error. And they reduced the error by sixfold. And they brought it down to about 5% relative instead of 30%. And within two weeks, we started seeing improved strains that just kept continuing. That pattern just kept continuing for the months and years to come. And literally overnight, by reducing the error in our measurement systems, we doubled the pace of progress, maybe even saved ourselves from flatlining in this company with the same people, the exact same amount of resources, I'd even argue less resources. And this pattern kept continuing because that company just kept improving and improving and improving the processes by which it, it did its work to the point where errors were as low as, I think, less than 2% measurement error in a biological system from year to year of the same, the same things. Um, but we weren't the first to learn this. This is an old, old lesson. It is the basis of so much of the tools in JUMP, um, so much it's tools that so many people have never yet discovered. And, and it, it astounds me that it isn't more widespread in some sense, despite JUMP's very wide use uh, and, and ease of use of such tools, most people don't know about them. Um, this was learned, these lessons were learned decades ago in the auto industry where total quality was introduced by the Japanese and it transformed their productivity. Their productivity increased threefold vehicles per worker over a 20 year span. While the U.S. industries, which didn't change their quality practices, saw flatlining, just like that example before. 
And the lessons that have been learned over and over and over and over are so familiar to many of you who use Jump and who work in statistics. It's the make process. Design, measure, analyze, improve, control. But that is typically thought of as an operations and manufacturing game that only can you apply that if you have a repeated exactly the same process over and over and over. But it's not true. It's just as important to research and development practices as it is to manufacturing. Because at the end of the day, R&D is running the process as well. They're running measurement processes and their, their product is data. R&D is manufacturing data. And those processes which manufacture data ought be just as high quality as the ones that make an automobile. But it needs to be a little different. There's more exchange of ideas. There's a bit more iteration because you're exploring the unknown. So we need to adjust that. Um, but at the core, we need to start by recognizing that experiments themselves in an R&D sense are measurement processes that can be improved. And when you recognize that, you then can take the total quality approach. And the three core pillars of that approach, in my mind, are process visibility, which leads to higher quality processes, which leads to better data, which leads to improved processes, which leads to higher quality and improved data. And then this, this positive cycle of improvement ultimately leads to data that you can trust, that's meaningful, that's contextualized, that can be put into deep machine learning algorithms and visualizations and get answers that you can, can believe. And that, when that happens, the R&D cycle goes faster and faster and faster. And the cost will drop from $2.6 billion per drug to a lot less than that. That's my belief. Uh, I've seen evidence that that can be true and I'll show you a little bit of that um, with some examples. So, one example of this problem and, uh, and its solution is here. This is from another customer where we were helping them um, improve their screening processes for the production of, a, of another strain of uh, another microorganism. And they had been struggling for some months with a situation where they would screen these strains. They would then pick what were their hits, their winners, and they would then send those winners to the next stage of development. And that group, 3,000 miles away would say, these aren't, these aren't working. I don't get it. What, what's, what's the problem here? You keep sending us these hits and, and yet they're not working. So we implemented uh, the Riffin data system and they implemented some great analytics themselves on top of that data system um, using Jump and other tools. And when you looked at that data, we found a set of experiments with common reference strains. And when you looked at those reference strains, we looked for variables that were high variance across those reference strains. And the most obvious one was the media lot that was being fed to them. And there was quite a lot of variation across lot to lot. Assuming there's a variation within the lots because you're testing lots of different genetic backgrounds, yet there was even more variation between lots. So that was a, that was a clue. And then we looked for other effects and we saw that temperature two was strongly affecting outcomes. And both of these lot and temperature, with, which we tested with a simple regression and jump, were highly predictive. Once we took those effects out of the data, so we removed the effect of lot and temperature and we re-ranked re all of their strains with the corrected data set, what we found was that essentially nothing was statistically significant in their data set. So what they had been doing was picking what they thought were winners, sending them downstream for very expensive further development, but it was, they were just sending garbage, basically unimproved uh, strains. So there could have been two outcomes from this. That group could have got angry that we were telling themselves this, telling them this and said, I don't believe this crap. Or they could have said, boy, this, this tells us something important. And they took the latter approach. They went back and they re-engineered their processes. They got their processes under control. And as soon as they did that, they saw the same impact that I had just previously told you about. Their screening program started leaping and forward at an accelerated rate. And the things they sent downstream were working. And they got their products uh, moving much faster. 
So the question is, when we know these lessons, when we have tools like the ones that Riffin provides, which I'll tell you about in a moment, and the ones that uh, Jump provides, why do we not do what we can do? I mean, why don't we, why don't we do better? Um, and the answer is um, because it's really hard. <laughs> because, and uh, Phil said this at the beginning, our data is a mess. Um, it takes us two to three months sometimes just to assemble, assemble the data from a single development batch. And when that's the case, you just don't ask the question. You just don't even bother. You take guesses with partial data and you move on. And the cycle of, of missed opportunity and false positives and so forth continues. And you don't know what you're missing. And we have a, a nice term for this, uh, endearing term. We call cleaning up the data, that job, data wrangling. But it's not a fun job. And this is what so many people know intuitively and in fact. Most of their time, if they're doing statistical analysis or data mining or AI or whatever you'd like to call it, is spent just cleaning up bad data. But there's a limit to how far bad data can be cleaned up. And that's the problem that Riffin is trying to solve. And the start of Riffin, in, in some sense, uh, it started with Jump. Um, so I learned Jump from someone named Tom Little. He's a consultant who teaches Jump. And he does an incredibly wonderful job of teaching it. And I didn't get to participate in all of his class, but I, I took enough of it that I got hooked on jumping. And, and then it was, it was uh, game over. I just kept going deeper and deeper over time. And, um, and as, that, as that happened, um, sorry, I'm getting a call. So as that happened, um, I became aware of the, this problem of data. And I, I said to Tom, I said, well, this is really cool. I totally get it. This could be absolutely transformative. But how do you get this data in there? Because you give us these nice, clean, beautiful data tables. It's not what it looks like in my experience. And he said, well, the truth is, there is no simple solution to that. I said, well, there must be some software out there that does this, that cleans it up and delivers it. He said, no, there isn't. And I don't even think it's a solvable problem. Um, it's just an ad hoc solution in every case. And I took that as a challenge. So that led to uh, a hypothesis. Businesses are, I wrote this down in 2013. Um, businesses are driven by, by processes. Processes remain inefficient and ineffective because they're invisible, because we don't make them transparent to the organization, which leads to quality problems and it leads to data problems. Um, and that then led to Riffin Nexus, um, where Riffin Nexus is um, Riffin Nexus is the software, cloud-based software that Riffin produces, which is a process data system. It's a data system for collecting and integrating and organizing your data uh, for scientific discovery, based on processes as the center of the world. Um, and the the premise is that if you do that, not only can you get in integrated data instantly, but you can solve some of these core quality and context problems that prevent us from moving faster and using the great tools that are out there for analysis. Um, so the world we've known today has typically revolved around two kinds of scientific data uh, system, sample centric limb systems, which have a lot of structure, um, but they lose a lot of context and they're inflexible and ELN systems, which are flexible and provide context, but no structure. And as a result, you sort of trade off between these two in today's world, and you can never get to the kind of data we'd really like to have for machine learning and statistics. Uh, Riffin's approach was to put the process at the center of the world, and, and through that, get both. Because once you design and draw your process, it articulates the structure, structures you need for data capture. And if you marry that with versioning, you can actually have a dynamic and flexible system. And that's what we have. Riffin is a data system which takes data from many different routes, from manual data to parsing instrument files to uh, querying databases and, and push and pull through API. It puts that data into the context of the processes you operate and then automatically uh, reshapes that data into a statistical data frame for analysis and tools like Jump are and others. Um, 
what that looks like, but, uh, sort of marrying that with the scientific uh, learning cycle um, with Riffin um, and with, with science in general, a process-oriented scientific approach, you start by designing your process. And we provide a visual interface, drag and drop, create the models of these processes and all the input and output parameters across such a process. You then can create an instance of that process um, to capture data on it. And then um, and what you see here is each row of this is a trial or run. Uh, could be a designed experiment where you have multiple runs across multiple steps of this process and you collect all your data on that from various sources. Um, it tracks the samples and the linkages across all these steps so you can correlate. It transforms all this into a statistical data table that's concatenated across multiple exper experiments and versions, and it delivers it for analysis in third-party tools. And we explicitly chose to make the analysis externalized because we believe the tools that are out there are already fantastic, and it doesn't make sense to try to reinvent the wheel of analysis when Jump and others have invested decades into perfecting these. What you want is the ability to transform and deliver that data in real time to such tools. And so that's what Riffin does. And here's a, another view of the interface. And here we're showing that everything's versioned. So as you continuously learn, you can modify these processes and create a history of versions. And the data on all of those versions is automatically concatenated together for analysis. Um, you can also compare those versions. And this is an add-in we wrote for Jump which plugs in through the API to this system and it can extract the process information and then do a diff of those processes here. For example, you see that a unit was changed from hours to minutes between two processes and some spec limits were added and values of spec limits were changed. Um, and our vision is that what this becomes is the basis for an iterative product development cycle on a digital backbone that is very much like the computer-aided design cycle we use in discrete manufacturing, where you create blueprints or, um, or computer-aided design files for your processes, which you iteratively improve with data over and over through multiple versions until you get close to manufacturing. And then you transfer that design file through a digital means directly to your manufacturing system where it's prototype, a prototype of production or actual production is run and then you integrate the data back into the R&D backbone so that you can learn from the differences between those R&D and manufacturing process. Um, and to finish up as a final example of the kind of thing we've done um, with, um, with companies, this is a case study we developed with, um, with Novozymes on the basis of the work they did using not just Riff and Nexus, but also lab automation that they built and an analytics pipeline that they built on, on the backbone that Riffin provided. Um, this was a fermentation process where they were, uh, sorry, it was um, not fermentation process. It was a combination of screening and fermentation and other things, but it was to produce advanced yeast, uh, biofuse yeast that consolidated the enzymes, the digestive enzymes for converting uh, amylose into sugar uh, with the uh, yeast themselves to get higher efficiency fermentations, ethanol fermentation. Um, they developed these strains with this technology and over the course of 18 months were able to deliver four brand new strains to market, which may or may not make sense to you until you realize that this was uh, two times faster than any historical product development effort at Novozymes. And they did it with 50% of the normal personnel effort in their project teams. Um, and they had, in the course of doing this, increased their throughput for screening um, tenfold as well. So these principles do work. And we've been able to have an enormous impact on the pace of discovery. In this case, it's industrial biotech. But I do believe it's, it's the same outcome can happen in pharmaceuticals. And we have seen some of that already starting to happen where with some of our customers, we've taken the data preparation time down from 40 hours to three hours a week, or saved groups uh, 24 under hours a year, a full person worth of effort in a team of four. 
And this is really the future that we hope to bring, uh, one where you marry process with process design and, and quality improvement and data analytics with tools like Jump to shave not a few dollars, not a few, few weeks off of that pharmaceutical development cycle, but years off the pharmaceutical development cycle and turn $2.6 billion per drug into hopefully a few hundred million dollars per drug in some time. And that's our goal, and that's, that's the mission of Ripon. So thanks for your time and attention today. Thank you so much, Tim. And yeah, I, I love the mission, and I think you're right. That would be really great for all of humanity to take both money, but also really the time off that kind of development. So thank you so much. Yeah. And our next, yeah. In our next segment, we have Heath Rushing from at Sergio to take us through statistics for pharma and biopharma development and manufacturing. Welcome to the program, Heath. Hey, thanks a lot, Julian. And uh, let me uh, start this here. All right. Well, good morning. I'll uh, tell you just, uh, just very quickly about me. Um, I'm not going to do anything with PowerPoint. What I'm going to do is probably just to uh, focus here on, uh, on Jump. Uh, and and uh, as I uh, tell you a little bit about me and uh, the uh, the company, I'll kind of tell you about where this presentation came about. So, uh, at Sergo is a professional services company. We we do a lot of uh, training and consulting. Uh, my background is I was uh, originally in the military, and uh, then happened to do some work with C Medical Center one summer that uh, led me into really wanting to go into biotech. Went to work for a small biotech company called Applied Molecular Genetics. They were um, uh, the uh, it's a uh, long the short name is called Amgen. I uh, worked in their manufacturing in Colorado, and then uh, went with a, a bunch of band of of uh, rogue scientists up in Seattle, Washington, after they bought Immunex, and uh, got to go up there in a clinical uh, clinical quality engineering, clinical manufacturing, a bunch of uh, process development types. Just a, a great bunch of uh, just a great team up there. Uh, before I uh, came to uh, SAS, I was head of jump training for a number of years. Uh, before I uh, went out on my own as a consultant and do a lot of work with pharma biopharma, right? Uh, and uh, so uh, I do a lot of training and a lot of consulting, and uh, this really comes from my, my training. Probably uh, our most popular course is a course called Applied Statistics for Scientists. It's got a lot of uh, engineering examples just because in my, uh, in my time uh, in a pharma and biopharma, I've worked with a lot of chemical engineers. So uh, it's, a, it's a course that that brings in uh, yeah, a lot of really the first day is jump, the second day is statistics, and the third day is, is model building. And uh, what I found is, is this is a very general course. It's uh, for a lot of different industries, uh, and uh, the uh, problems are real world problems. Uh, but I would show something, and you know, I would be, in, even if it was in a SAS training center, someone at lunchtime would say, you know, Heath, you showed something, and, and really, you know, how, how, does, how does it apply to this very specific thing that I'm trying to do? Uh, or they'd say, you know, you showed about, a, you know, you showed about a, what, this is what a design experiment is, and, and you can do this, but, but this is what I would like to do. And then so th this is kind of that next step forward, right? So I would show a lot of the different jump platforms that people use, and they'd say, yeah, but, you know, you, you showed me how to do analysis of covariance, but, you know, I, I really need to do stability analysis and set expiration date. And uh, I said, okay, well, I can, I can show you how it can be adapted for that, but I can also show you that, that jump has some tools for you. Uh, so uh, but that's what this talk is about, really. Uh, and so the first one I'm going to show is a, is a very simple one, uh, and it is really just to show gra uh, gra Jump's ability to build graphs, all right? And so say that I uh, have this in class and I say, hey, this is a data set. Uh, this is the change in housing prices from the first quarter of 1976 until the second quarter of 2010. This is all 50 states in the District of Columbia. Changing housing prices, you see that I did some clustering. We won't talk about clustering today, but I have this in this data set. And I say, you know, the, the really great thing about Jump is, is boy, you can, you know, you can build a, uh, you can build a, a, a map shape with a Jump. And, uh, you know, those are the different states. Here are the changing housing prices. All right. And I often do this, as I say, I don't want anyone to think that Texas is bigger than Alaska. And so I've changed this graph up and I say, hey, you know, what you'll see is, is, is Alaska is 2.3 times the size of Texas. All right. Uh, and then you do something where uh, you take this graph 
and you add a background map and you show the world and everyone in the room goes, ooh, ah, that's, that's pretty neat. Jump can build uh, maps. And, and then of course, you know, I'll be sitting at lunch and someone else say, you know, he, he, you showed that maps, but I, when, I'm a scientist. Why would you show this in a, in a class for scientists? I mean, how many scientists build? And I'm like, well, you know, you have some in agriculture and things like that. But what if you could adapt that? Uh, what, what if, uh, you know, you are a scientist, what, you know, what if you could adapt that and instead of building some sort of map shape, what you could do is, is you could build a 96 well plate. And then I'm looking at some sort of relative potencies. Now, any of you that look at 96 well plates, you know that you have a result for each of those locations. Uh, you could pull that in. And, you know, you could do all kinds of things with that. Like you could say, hey, you know, what if I want to know about a particular location on that plate? And you could do that too. So that really what you're doing is you're adjusting jumps capabilities to look at those different plates, right? So it's that map ability that jump has that you're just adapting to, to what you want to do, right? Uh, the, uh, then your next question is, is, hey, can, does it have a 384 well plate? It's like, yeah, that's what we have those two, okay? Is all that we're doing is, is we're just adjusting uh, jumps capabilities to, uh, to suit what we're trying to do, right? That's a pretty interesting one. Uh, next, let me, uh, let me jump into something uh, that may be more uh, appropriate for uh, those in the audience. I'm sure that a lot of you have either done stability analysis. I'm sure that everyone in this room has experienced something with stability analysis, right? Uh, and it's uh, really from this document right here, okay? It's called Q1A, uh, Evaluation of Stability Data. Uh, and what you're doing is you're setting uh, explorations. Uh, in here, uh, what it does is it talks about, it talks about doing tests for poolability, all right? Uh, th this, is just, this is just analysis of covariance. And it says, hey, do you want to pool batches or not? Now, I'm not going to spend time uh, going over, you know, uh, all the, the, uh, the, different, uh, the different nuances of stability analysis. But what I will tell you is there's really three different situations, three different major situations, okay? Uh, one is where you have one, one or multiple batches where the degradation rate of some, say, like an impurity or potency um, is a purity or potency is, is, uh, is a lot different or significantly different than the others, right? Uh, you could have a situation where the degradation rate is the same, but it has a has a different uh, a different common intercept, right? It does not have a common intercept. It has a you know really a difference in means. And then you can have where multiple batches are exactly the same, right? Uh, so say that I'm in a class and I say, hey, let me uh, let me teach you you know graphically you know how could we uh, look at this? Let's look at relative potency uh, over time. Uh, and me, I, I don't like black dots. So what I'll do is, is, is I will uh, close these by batch. And what we can do is, is we can fit an equation for each one of these. And I'm just showing you this graphically so that you can see that you can see that one of these batches is different than the rest. In the stability analysis, in this situation, what you would do is, is you would take batch one. Actually, you would take all three batches batch one, two, and three, and you build a 95% confidence interval around them, being that relative potency decreases over time, that lower 95%, and see it where it crosses some acceptance criteria. In this case, is maybe it's a specification, right? Uh, and then what you immediately do is, is, is you say, well, you know, that this is really a model, right? Uh, in this model is, is I take relative potency, and I would look at batch month. It's called analysis of covariance. Uh, this graph should look very familiar. Why? Because I just showed it to you. That's from fit y by x, right? Uh, and what I see here is, is, is that all of these are significant, okay? So the batch month interaction effect is significant. That means that relative potency is degrading over time, right? There's a difference in batches. You can tell that. And that degradation rate is different for different batches. Now, a lot of times somebody will say, okay, you taught me analysis of covariance, now how does this apply to, to a stability? And I'll say, well, in stability, if you look at Q1E, what you do is you do inverse prediction, 
And in this case is because the batches are different, you would want to do it for all the batches. That lower one-sided and say all the potency is uh, 75. I'm gonna see where that crosses some threshold. And boy, I tell you what, my, um, my stability does not look very good here. I, I, I don't have a, a very good expert. Right? Now in this case is you would say, okay, I understand that boy, that was an awful lot of steps to do. And, and I say, yeah, and, and indeed that, that is an awful lot of steps to do. Uh, but let's take another scenario. Let's take a scenario where uh, I'm gonna look at situation two. Okay, uh, now in, uh, in JUMP is all those different steps are laid out for you to do stability analysis, set expiration date, and to follow this guidance document, this ICH guidance document. Uh, it's in the stability platform uh, under analyze, reliability and survival, degradation, stability test. Uh, and when John Saul did a lot of work on this up front, uh, run, relative potency is my response, month as my time, batch as my label system ID, and I put the specification limit. And you'll see that what happens is, what happens is, is whenever I do this, let me do this real quick again, there we go, is it does the test for me. It shows me that I have different intercepts, but a common slope and it gives me that earliest crossing time. Now in this case, it does all the tests for me and it uses an alpha level of 0.25. I can't think of any other place in jump that by default uses an alpha level of 0.25. The reason why it does this is because that's what it tells you to do in the ICH guideline. And it sets that expiration date for you. All right? It even gives you an inverse prediction. I know a lot of people like this is where it shows you that for each one of these, if I'm looking at a particular month, right, what would my, uh, what would my level be? And even in the prediction graph, it says for a particular month, you say, hey, what would it be for 12 months? Is it would tell you what the, the average relative potency is going to be? Okay. And now the good thing is, is uh, I can uh, quite easily, uh, once I've done this, uh, I apologize, I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, I do degradation, do stability, I'll use the recall. Oh, okay, so uh, boy, that was, that was fast. Uh, and then what I can do is just save the script, right? Uh, so once I have it uh, done for, uh, for one of these is, let's just say that I have another scenario, and I'm gonna bring up that situation three, right? And then so what you have is, is situation two and situation three, if I put those together, uh, what I have is, is boy, I have this script right here. Uh, I'm just going to right click on here and copy this one. Uh, and I'm going to go over here. And I'm just going to paste it here. And I'm off and running. It's a different situation. It's the situation where all three of them are exactly the same. And what it does is it averages them or pulls them. They have a common intercept and a common slope. Right, so that analysis, covariance, inverse prediction, setting expiration dates that you, a lot of you have done through FIT model is, is, is all those steps are outlined for you right there in Stability Platform. Okay. I want to bring up another uh, another example. It's you know how to use nonlinear regression, right? A lot of times somebody will ask me in a class, they'll say, "Hey Heath, you know, I'm just say stability analysis. You know, hey Heath, what I'm doing is is I'm looking at uh, many of you. This should look familiar." degradation, uh, the Arrhenius acceleration factor, right? And they say, hey, you know, we're looking at some, uh, some accelerated testing heat, and, you know, I'm looking at relative potency over time. Uh, and, you know, I looked at different temperatures. And you can tell that uh, the, the nonlinear, this is, this is definitely nonlinear, the nonlinear uh, degradation over time depends upon temperature. And you know, does Jump have a way of uh, of modeling that? Of course, it does. Uh, is this formula, as as I've showed you before, you can do this once. Once you've done it once, is uh, I can do that uh, through uh, through nonlinear. I can pull the degradation model at my response, and I can fit that model. I like to look at a profiler to see what this looks like. Uh, is I can see uh, with this is 
I can see the relative potency changing over time. And I can see that, that nonlinear relationship, but I also see that it depends upon temperature. For lower temperatures, the degradation rate is not as steep. For higher temperatures, of course, is what happens is it degrades rather quickly. Okay. I say, well, that, that's fine, uh, but I'm not, doing, uh, I'm not doing degradation analysis. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I'm doing is, is, uh, is I'm doing bioassay. Okay, then I say, yeah, you can do that uh, through bioassay. Uh, and uh, specialized modeling is to just go to fit curve, where you look at the toxicity and the log concentration. And in that case, you're probably fitting a four parameter logistic curve. And you can fit that curve. And you say, well, Heath, that's, that's, uh, that's really neat. And really what I'd like to do is I'd like for jump to, you know, jump to, uh, to do my potency calculations, all right? Now, I'm gonna use the example where two of these are different, okay? So I have some test B versus a standard. And I say, okay, well, I, I just showed you that. I just showed you that you could fit this under specialized modeling, fit curve, all right? I, I'll just hit recall. The only thing that I need to do is, is I need to group these by formulation where I'm looking at standard versus test B. And uh, I know that I'm fitting a four parameter logistic curve. To any of you that do bioassays you're familiar with, there most definitely is a change in uh, potency here. Uh, and then so from here is, is whenever I'm fitting this four parameter logistic curve, if I do a test of parallelism, when I do the test of parallelism, I'll see that automatically jump pulls up a measure of the potency. Uh, this is uh, one uh, thing that's not very common is that you can also do equivalence tests on each of the parameter fit. Where you're looking at equivalence tests between the growth rate, the inflection point, the lower asymptote and the upper asymptote, right? The four parameters of those. This is using a uh, platform and jump fit curve to calculate your potencies for you. It's uh, surprising that uh, many people in our, in our world don't necessarily know that JUMP has that capability. Okay. Uh, the next, I know that I should probably do process control uh, before I do process capability, but there's a reason why I'm showing you process capability first. I know that someone on the phone would say, say Heath, you know, you need to make sure your process is in control before you check capability, and I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, but I want to show you this, okay? I want to show you something with process capability because under process control, I'm going to show you a tool that allow you to do, to do both, right? Uh, with our process capability, uh, there is, uh, you see that what I've done is, is I've inserted specifications uh, in, my, uh, in, my, uh, in my column properties, okay? Those specifications, I've inserted those. Uh, and there's, there's, there's multiple ways to do this. I mean, you know, I could, uh, I could look at process capability by just going analyze distribution. Right? Uh, I could uh, do process capability by uh, just uh, doing a, a control chart. Now I have my process capability indices. Right. I could even use the capability pl platform. So there's multiple ways for me to do process capability here. Okay. Now, what I really wanted to show you is, is, is that you have, you know, you have the different measures of doing process capability distribution, and you have, uh, you can do that through graphs, you can do that through process capability. Uh, but, but really, this is what, uh, this is what happens a lot is somebody says, yeah, but, but Heath, you know, you, you set these specification levels here, but, you know, I have different specification levels for, say, the Europeans, EMA, and the uh, U.S. FDA. All right. Uh, and so I say, okay, well, well there's a, there's a, 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 um, a platform and jump that'll help you out with that. So say these are my three CQAs. All right. Uh, and I'm going to bring up the EMA as I say, hey, these are EMA specs. These are the Europeans. I'm going to leave these. And then so from here is, is what I want to do is I want to do process capability around these three. 
uh, very simply is, is under quality and process, instead of going to process capability, I go where it says manage specification limit. And here are my CQAs. And I can load those from a, a data table. I have those, those are called EMA. Uh, I like to save this column properties, and even show limits and save the column properties. So that now in any of those platforms, whenever I'm doing this is, it's going to use those limits. Now what you say is, is you say, yeah, but, but Heath, you know, what I, what I have here is, is, is I also have different specs for the FDA. So I have different specs from the FDA than I have for uh, EMA. And I say, no problem. It's the same thing as we did before. Quality process. Manage specification limits. Load from table. I like to show those limits. And whenever I do that distribution, it's going to do the capability for uh, for my uh, for my EMA limits. Sorry, for my FDA limits versus my EMA limits. Now, I want to show you something uh, that, uh, that uh, a, lot, a lot of people do not know about this. It's kind of surprising, and I like this, especially whenever I have large data sets. Uh, is, is there's an option uh, to color out of spec values? Uh, so that what it does is it colors these where the red is above specification uh, and the uh, blue. I'm sorry, the, the, red is above, uh, the red is below specification, the blue is above specification. Right. Manage specification limits. You know how to do process capability through distribution, through process capability, and through, say, like control chart builder. But whenever you have varying specifications from different agencies, uh, you, uh, there's an ability to, to be able to change, uh, to interchange those. Okay. Our next is process control. Uh, quite simply, uh, you know how to build process control charts. You know, if I just did, a, say, like I was looking at time, pH, temperature, and rate for a certain number of lots. Uh, Andy Zangi did a great job with uh, the control chart builder. I was really excited about this. Then you build those process control charts. All right, and you can pull in lot. All right. Uh, but let's say that you say, well, Heath, I want to add, you know, process capability to this, and I don't have four of these, but I have 400, and, you know, I'd really like to see more of a dashboard type, right? Uh, Jump, has a, uh, Jump has a tool for that, uh, and I'm not sure if it's, uh, it's, it's uh, I'm not sure how well known it is, but let's just say instead uh, I have a data set here. Uh, I'm going to look at these final measurements. And with these final measurements, uh, I have both my control limits and spec limits. I'm not going through analyze quality and process. I'm going to go to analyze. It's under screening. It's called process screening. And I have those final measurements. Uh, these are individual moving range control charts, just in case you're wondering. Uh, and then what I do is I have a, a dashboard. I like to uh, add here uh, different tests, right? I mean, you have the ability to add uh, the uh, the different tests with these. Uh, but here, I just wanted to show you the the uh, the capability of this uh, of this platform here. You know, you see a dashboard, and it looks like that. You know, and uh, boy, I tell you what, uh, with center here, I'm I'm a little worried because I have some alarms uh, with a bottom. It looks like that I'm not in very good shape with process capability. Uh, so with center, uh, what I can do is, is first thing I can do is, is just very simply look at a quick graph of that. And I say, wow, boy, it looks like that I have some out of control points here. Maybe what I want to do is, is I want to go straight to control charts and it'll build that control chart for me for just center that I can focus my attention on just center. Right. Next is I say, Hey, you know, with, with bottom right here, you know, with bottom, uh, this is a problem with with um, uh, this is a problem with process capability, and I can very easily look at process capability from here. Just process capability. Right. 
So a lot of times is that, you know, I say, especially when you have a large number of variables and you want to look at a control chart, or you want to look at process capability, you know how to do that. But what if I had five, six, 10 of those variables, 10, 20, 30, 100, uh, and you know, I, I want to know what to focus on. All right. Taking an existing uh, jump, uh, existing jump platforms and putting it really into one place in that dashboard effect. The last thing I'm going to show you is this. Uh, is uh, I did this talk uh, at the uh, Jump Discovery co co uh, Conference in Tucson last year, and uh, I really, I really enjoyed this because along the way, including the morning of, I was learning new things. Uh, this is what I have: is um, many of you know about a optimal design. Uh, I'm going to load these responses, and I have two: I have yield and byproduct, uh, and you know uh, about these optimal designs and I optimal designs. I'm going to load these factors. And if I wanted to do screening, what I could do is, is add some interaction effects here. Uh, and then I'm just going to do 16 runs here, make design, make table. Uh, and you'll see that I have a deoptimal design, right? Okay, deoptimal designs are used for screening, determining significant process parameters. The optimality is um, minimizing the standard error associated with parameter estimates, right? Uh, now, what if I wanted to do more, uh, more prediction optimization? Uh, what I may want to do is, is go and have jump give me a design using response surface methodology. It's called an eye optimal design. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to let this run for, for 10 seconds. And it's using something called the coordinate exchange algorithm to find the design that minimizes the prediction variance integrated eye across your design region. All right. Uh, and then so, you know, Jump would provide me the ability to do an iOptimal design. Now with iOptimal designs, I want to find the, really for prediction optimization, is I want to find the, the, uh, the optimal level of time and pH and temperature and rate that maximize yield and minimize byproduct. Now let's think about that. Is could a different time, pH, temperature and rate maximize yield and I have a different time, pH, temperature, and rate that minimize byproduct. Of course, I'm not going to have the same one. And then so what I would do is, is I would, I'm not going to save it. There we go. Uh, is what I would do is, is I'll put these in and under my responses is what I can do is I can put some sort of importance and some sort of weighting. And let's just say that, you know, yield is important, but byproduct is three times as important as yield. So whenever I'm doing prediction, uh, prediction optimization, say using the prediction profiler, it's going to find the optimal time, pH, temperature, and rate that is going to maximize yield and minimize byproduct. However, it's going to weight this, right? It's going to have byproduct that is three times as important as yield. Now, what if the next question is, yeah, but Heath, I know that you can that you can set an importance to the responses. What about the factor effects? Like what if temperature and rate is something, Phil said it, Phil said we live in a world that is in biological systems, they're dominated by interactions, they're dominated by quadratic effects, and you may even have some idea that, hey, he's pH temperature, let me tell you. I, I want a design that really focuses on pH temperature and temperature squared and, and pH squared. And then so I say, okay, you can do that. Right. So uh, in a uh, in jump team, uh, it is called an a optimal design. And then once I do an a optimal design under advanced options, I can wait certain interactions like the pH temperature interaction more important than the others. It's called an a optimal design. The yeah, optimal designs uh, really talk about the arithmetic average and really focuses on the diagonal part of the, the uh, information matrix. Uh, the, uh, the key here is, is I'm able to design experiments that are really focusing more importance on some interactions or some quadratic effects. Right, a optimal design. All right, uh, everyone, so uh, to uh, give a summary, Right. I, I showed you really uh, six different examples, you know, how to do uh, six different examples where 
you used, probably existing things that you've used before, and how do you take it a step further? How do you answer that next question? Uh, I showed you one where we were looking at maps. Jump has the capability to do maps, but what if I want to adapt that to 96 well plate? Is Jump has the ability to do spill analysis and fit model, but what if I want to, to use an alpha level of 0.25, like the guidance document tells me, I want to have Jump do this for me. It's in the stability platform. I know how to do nonlinear regression through nonlinear and through fit curve, but what if I wanted to have to calculate my relative potencies for me? And process capability, right? Process capability, I was showing how you can use managed specifications, and what that allow you to do is do process capability where you have differing specification levels. In process control, I showed you how to use process screening. In process screening is I have more of a dashboard for both process control and process capability. And last, but certainly not least, in DOE, you know how to set an importance for responses. Now is you're able to use a optimal designs that will set importance for factor and factor effect. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Uh, I uh, am uh, with uh, Ed Sergo. We do training and consulting in pharma biopharma. Uh, if you have any questions, please make sure just to uh, give, give me a call, look me up. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Heath. Uh, the trainer in you shows. So that was a really great coverage of a lot of different tools and jump. We appreciate you being on the program. In our next segment, we have Jeff Mann, Life Science Principal Product Manager, here to talk about Jump Clinical and Jump Genomics, helping vaccines, drug, and crops get to market. Dr. Mann, welcome to the show. Hi, Julian. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Are you able to see my screen? I can see it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. This is Jeff Mann. I've been down in the basement drinking coffee to come up and give you a motivational talk on life sciences in jump and there's no way I could match the enthusiasm of Heath. Uh, great job, Heath. That was awesome. Um, I just wanted to point out at the beginning of my talk, uh, all the gentlemen speaking are, are like myself. Uh, they are invested for the last 20 years or more in helping life sciences companies do better science. Uh, I think we're all in a little shock that people don't follow more rigorous statistics and visualizations to do so. And so my talk today will be a little bit different. I'll talk about specific products, but also I wanted to give you uh, an idea of how to access information about uh, everyone that spoke today and our teams uh, doing life sciences visualization analysis. So the title of my talk is Helping Vaccines, Drugs, and Crops Get to Market. Uh, we do this a lot. We actually help those customers uh, deliver these products uh, personally. Everyone in our group is dedicated to that research. Um, Jump has a variety of products available on the market for life sciences. And uh, I'm going to focus on the right side of this slide on Jump Clinical and Jump Genomics today. But as you've heard today, uh, these products fit in all sorts of spaces, especially in the pharmaceutical uh, life, science, uh, life cycle. And so uh, the three guests before me had spoken about how to use Jump and Jump Pro in, in several different areas and they're really uh, doing a great job with our customers and helping support them do their scientific work. Uh, basically, they did my job in mentioning to you some of the other areas that we, we really help pharmaceutical companies deliver products in a much uh, more controlled way and a much more profitable way in the end. But today I'm here to talk about Jump Clinical and Jump Genomics, and a lot of it uh, is centered on uh, Russ Wolfinger's ideas uh, about 20 years ago to start shifting some of his focus from pure statistical mathematics in, in the form of mixed models to genetics analysis and understanding that. I think his wife is a biologist and, and she influenced his thinking that 
uh, genomics data really needs a more robust way of providing more reproducible results. And, and that has proven to be very true. Um, and so his first foray into that was developing a product uh, with, with a larger team involved to support him. And so there are a lot of scientists at Jump and uh, specifically our life sciences team that develop, helps develop these products. And we sit on top of both Jump and SAS. Uh, these two products use Jump and SAS and now R and Python and, and reach out to other programming languages to get whatever algorithmic or statistical problem that we want to solve. Uh, so a, an extension of our life sciences team are some of these individuals. A lot more people in Jump have a PhD than you might expect uh, at a normal company. I'm sure uh, our guest speakers before are familiar with this, that when you're trying to help people do better science, you need scientists. And a lot of times the Jump organization competes with our customers for for um, for great people and great scientists. And so any of these people on this list could walk away today and be at a pharmaceutical or life sciences company and we're grateful they're sticking with us. Uh, so Jump Genomics has really been focused uh, in, in more recent times on, on uh, breeding scientists and making crops uh, better and helping the breeders really use the genomic data to, to solve this problem. And so the first part of my talk here, I'll, I'll dedicate a little time uh, to Jump Genomics, which we just released, Jump Genomics 10. And there are a lot of cool new features in this, in this version. And uh, I wanted to point you that one of the first places you should go to get information about our products is the Jump community. Uh, if you just provide a login here and, and browse our scientific space, you'll find a lot of great articles, blogs, examples, downloadable examples from our scientists on how, how to perform different feet, uh, functionalities in Jump and Jump Pro, Jump Genomics, and Jump Clinical. Uh, in, this blog, in this particular blog, it's just a few days old, um, I'll highlight that we've got some releases for translational scientists and also, as I mentioned before, for the agronomics research. And I wanted to give a little time to really impress upon you the, the really cool science that our scientists are, are doing with this product. So uh, one of our scientists, Meijin, uh, we call him MJ, Meijan Guan, has a presentation on some new features he's added into Jump Genomics on analyzing single cell RNA sequencing data using Jump Genomics. Um, this is a really big deal because our Jump Clinical and Jump Genomics products are focusing a lot on tumor research and oncology uh, for the customers of our products. But what I thought was uh, really uh, cool along those lines was uh, a brief search that I did of Google Scholar. And so when you, when you uh, get familiarize yourself with Google uh, Scholar, you can really hone in on the search terms and all of these scientific papers, you can see that they're within this year. And so this particular paper was uh, refining a panel of correlates to predict vaccine efficacy. I thought that was a really cool uh, paper and highlighting a lot of the value of Jump Clinical. This particular paper here is for breast cancer. And this is really helping identify biomarkers and help develop an assay to use those biomarkers in predicting, predicting breast cancer. And then this one, maybe the coolest of all here, is uh, an application for a patent which is for predicting metastasis and recurrence in cutaneous melanoma. Uh, Jump Genomics is all over this paper, and it was, uh, it was uh, applied for by Castle Biosciences. 
uh, using chump genomics for that problem. So as you can see in the, in the translational space, we're really doing things that are above and beyond what you could do with a single set of uh, tools. And we've put it all together in chump genomics to allow those translational scientists to really pull in data, um, to, to visualize it, analyze it with uh, some of the top methods available in genomic sciences research. And that particular uh, example, uh, MJ's talk, which I reference, and it's, it's on our website and you can uh, view it at any time, it really goes through how you identify the genes that are different in, and expressing differently in, in different cell types. And so he's really created a, a workflow which makes it easy to visualize and understand uh, uh, why these different genes are, are behaving the way they are in different cell types. And one view we've used for a long time is sort of this ANOVA analysis where we use this clustering along with the volcano plots here to identify some of these genes. And it could be uh, proteins, it could be metabolomics data, but we use this particular view to really hone in on the differences under different conditions. Uh, it's, it's, it's more based off different statistics that did, than DOE, but we're still trying to look across different uh, factors, if you will, on how to analyze these genomes. And so this particular view is really uh, a really um, space-constrained view and way to visualize multiple dimensions of the data, drill down to browsers, uh, genome browsers, and fit more models. Uh, and then use Venn diagrams, all kinds of cool uh, tools in one place to, to do so. And it's not just for translational sciences. Uh, some of our users may be more familiar with our cutting edge agronomics research. Uh, and I've highlighted here a latest video from Luciano da Costa e Silva, where he, he shows more of our plant breeding uh, enhancements for customers who are really, really pushing evolution to its edge where they're able to in silico breed uh, different strains of different organisms. And, and these publications that I've highlighted here will show you again uh, a lot of cool research in uh, different organisms, some of them hexaploid wheat, uh, we do a lot of work in oats um, and, and then diversified grains for animal and human food supplies, even uh, registering new plants who are, which are more mold and blight resistant. Uh, as if any of you have seen uh, some of the latest sci-fi films, it, they, they, like Interstellar, they talk about how these crops are starting to uh, not have any more resistance to, to some of the organisms that are attacking them. And we, we hope that jump genomics delays that a little further, but uh, no, no need to worry now at the moment in time. And, and so further, I highlight some of the accolades of, of Russ Wolfinger, who I mentioned earlier, who all of us have been working with for quite some time now. And I, I, I wanted to uh, highlight those, those talks as, I, as I've shown you. Uh, my colleague Kelsey Miklos also gave a, a nice overview of plant breeding and genomics in a previous Jump on Air segment. I would uh, recommend you taking a look at that. That's also linked out from that blog. Uh, as you can see, Mejan and Luciano's talks are available. And then also a lot of our customers uh, have given some really nice stories about how they're using our software um, and, and in, in particular in translational sciences, but also uh, in breeding and, and optimizing uh, different foods. Uh, and you see General Mills here looking at healthier oats around the world. But as I mentioned, uh, a lot of this centers around some of the original work and ideas uh, from Russ Wolfinger, 
and most recently he spends a lot of his time uh, on Kaggle. And right now, as of today, it looks like he's still in the lead on the COVID-19 private leaderboard. Uh, and as you can see, he's a, a five-star general master in the Kaggle world. He's, I don't know what that means, but I do know that it's hard to get him around November and May of any given year. So uh, uh, you might not be able to reach him today. So, so that's sort of uh, a flavor of, of jump genomics. And so I want to point out to uh, Tim's earlier comment today that, uh, you know, a lot of these machine learners like Russ spend a lot of time cleaning their data. And uh, another colleague, Don McCormick, gives a nice uh, presentation in, in uh, the community about data wrangling, as Tim titled it. And Russ really gives you a bird's eye view of the pitfalls that he runs into when preparing his data for Kaggle competitions. And so I thought this was a great blog highlighting a lot of the features of Jump that really, uh, since this blog, uh, John Saul and others have improved some of the data cleaning methods as well. And just so you know, it's not just me talking about it. Uh, here's some of the papers. If you, if you search in since 2020, you'll get some of these articles that I was referring to in this talk. But if you, um, if you go back a little bit and, and see my original searches and go back to any time, you'll see that there's almost a couple thousand papers of jump genomics out there doing research. And the bigger picture being jump, it's been around for over 25 years now. And if you look at the number of articles in jump, jump pro, jump genomics and jump clinical for for uh, helping solve the bigger problem of cancer. Uh, there are thousands of research articles on that. Uh, so I spend a lot of time in Google Scholar just looking and reading at papers and trying to understand what our customers do uh, with our software. A lot of really cool stories. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to talk to you about Jump Clinical. We just released an update to uh, 7 1 uh, last week, uh, or, or maybe earlier this week actually, and it's up to 7 1 2. And the product is really getting smarter and collects more metadata, and it really helps in that phase one, phase two, phase three of uh, clinical trials. And so this is a big deal right now in our time because a lot of these vaccines are coming through and, and they're gonna they're running clinical trials and they're monitoring these things live. And so I want to show you how our software helps helps do that uh, in an ongoing basis as you're following the clinical trials. Um, and in doing so we have a lot of customers who do this again in another blog that I wrote previously um, Jump has been used at the, the FDA uh, for probably 25 years. And so the, the medical reviewers there are very efficient at using Jump and Jump Clinical. And so I wrote a blog last year that talked about all the users at the FDA and PMDA. Uh, they're allowing us publicly to talk uh, about their usage. And actually this manual of policies and procedures by the FDA is publicly available. And if you just do a quick search on Jump and Jump Pro, you'll see that Jump and Jump Clinical, rather not Jump Pro, are required training for medical officers to reach a level two status. And so to that point, if you do a Google search on FDA reviews, these are in the public domain that you'll see uh, a lot of the drug reviews now of the submissions are being done with Jump Clinical. And it's because we do a lot out of the box and, and I'll show you some examples of that as well, where you can monitor these trials. In, in the FDA and PMDA's case, it's after the trials are over and they've been submitted and cleaned up and nice, but we like to, we like to say that we take the ugliest, dirtiest clinical trials data you can think of 
and we'll, our system should still uh, uh, accept that type of dirty data where you're, you're missing data points. A lot of uh, information is just not cleaned. And so before you pull out of the EDC systems for your clinical trials data, uh, you're, you're able to use the product. But these, this jump, uh, jump clinical is all over here. Um, let me reduce this window if I, maybe I can't here. I'll show you that a lot of these tables here that are printing are, are done with Jump Clinical in this paper. So um, this link is, is publicly available. There are other uh, reviews available that you'll see visualizations from Jump Clinical and I'll show you a few examples here soon. Um, and then finally, one of the other cool features of our software is not just for medical monitoring, it's for medical writers. And we help a lot of pharmaceutical organizations uh, generate narratives uh, from their data. So you can see this fairly well-written uh, paragraph of information around adverse events uh, is, is uh, very uh, tuned to the adverse events and maybe the con meds and medical history and laboratory data and written specifically uh, by templates we've created that help our customers uh, really generate thousands of narratives in a few seconds to minutes. Uh, our, some of our customers are, are on video at the end of this saying that they've, you know, they'll run thousands of narratives in a few minutes. Uh, and these are complicated oncology studies which have uh, hundreds of adverse events, sometimes per patient. And so they're very complicated uh, patient populations. And, and with our focus on cancer more recently, uh, this, this webinar that was given last uh, September, or August, uh, it's, it's linked out from the community and you can see how uh, the presenters from Amgen and Genentech and Insight find value out of our adverse event narrative reporting. And so Chum Clinical is also contributing to the research literature now. And uh, we have a lot of customer stories uh, that are falling out nicely. And, and I just wanted to give you a quick example of, of the types of monitoring you can do in Chum Clinical. Um, here, for example, is a look at the adverse events on this clinical trial. I've just got a dashboard uh, that I basically created with the click of a button. Uh, once you get your study data loaded, uh, you can choose what type of template you want to run. And I chose, uh, I chose this template right here, the medical monitoring uh, template. And once it loaded, I just pressed this button and it ran all of the reports. And so we're giving you uh, different types of views, whether it's uh, vital signs or laboratory data. Uh, we have specialized visualizations that our customers uh, really find value with. And, and this is done industry-wide while clinical trials are going on. And oftentimes they want to focus on things like uh, uh, adverse events of subjects that, that died. And so, for example, I can click on fatal events and filter all of the views simultaneously on just the events, just the subjects that had a fatal event. And so now I can see their medications they were on, uh, the laboratory time trend values of those patients. And so you're really filtering down on these patients that died and you wanna know why that happened. Um, we have specialized views like High's Law, which is a liver toxicity uh, algorithm that really identifies patients who, who might be uh, getting toxification of their liver by being on the drug. And you can further drill down on all of these. I can drill down on these enzymes, uh, alanine aminotransferase, and bilirubin aspartate aminotransferase over time, which is sort of how the eDish tool at FDA would look at that data. But I can also 
drill down on patient profiles at, at any subset within any visualization we provide. We give you access to on-the-fly patient profiles as well as on-the-fly adverse event narratives of those subjects. And this is really uh, something that's above and beyond what uh, products in the market can do. And so um, we, we'd really love the opportunity to share uh, more information and details and, and demonstrations of these products to you. So please, uh, if you will, reach out to us. Um, we're, as Julian had mentioned, we're making a, a lot of the information that we said in these uh, talks available uh, on the Jump On Air segment. So if you have any more questions, uh, please reach out to us. And so uh, that, that's it for the demo. And so uh, just wanted to point out that uh, we're creating new versions of the software. And these are, uh, these are, this is an example of Jump Live that I'm showing you here. And it's, it's really uh, the path forward for our Jump products where we're moving to visualizations on the web for a lot of your uh, consumers. Of, of our information and our reports. And so a customer that has Jump, Jump Pro, Jump Clinical, and Jump Genomics in the very near future will be able to visualize all of these uh, products output through Jump Live. And so just wanted to make you aware of our visualizations that are available through the web. And I can categorize these adverse events that I was showing you a moment ago to uh, outcomes, severity, uh, the, these sorts of different categorizations are very important to medical monitors when they're identifying what's happening to these patients uh, on the clinical trials. And so uh, uh, thanks again to uh, Tim and Phil and Heath for their presentations. Uh, it's I've gotten, I've had the pleasure of meeting Tim and Heath in person and Phil, look forward to you. And I've met several of your colleagues. So thanks again for uh, providing your presentation. Uh, it was, it was our pleasure. And so Julian, uh, I'll give it back to you now. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Jeff. And, and yeah, I love the message that you gave and also Tim gave really about, um, you know, good software advancing the speed at which we can get to these innovations. And that's, that's good for humanity. So thanks for all your team does uh, to help scientists do, do their work better and do their work faster. We're grateful. Uh, thanks be for being on. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. And our final segment of the day, we have Pete and Mary back for another tip of the day where they act out real life problems where a jump tip will solve the problem. Welcome to Jump On Air's tip of the day. Uh, how are you doing today, Mary? Great. So I understand that we have a task from our peers for the barbecue this afternoon. And um, they want you and I to go out and fetch mushrooms from the wild. Go figure. So <laughs> they, gave a, they gave me this table and I said, you and I should be able to figure out what's edible and what's poisonous so boy they are giving us a lot of credit i don't know if i would uh, trust us but okay let's go for it so um i'm gonna share my um let me share the data here uh-huh all right uh here we go so this all is right. the table they gave me right and they said so we have edibility here and all of these attributes of mushrooms. So I'm gonna put it in a graph builder. So you okay. and I can just kind of look at it and see if we can, we can handle this task. Okay. So um, we all know graph builder. So right here, and I'm gonna use a contingency. Okay. And I want poison to really stand out for us. So I'm just gonna change the color and I want it to be uh, red. So, and I want that Christmas look because I really want to understand that when it says, when it's red, we have to pay attention. Got it. But one of the things I was uh, toying with is I don't want to go through and then go, okay, let's bring odor in and then, you know, you do this and you bring it in and you look. 
But um, you were telling me that um, under the red triangle, there's something called column switcher. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I didn't know where to find it. Where do you where do you find column switcher? I couldn't. Yeah, it's nice and it conveniently located under that redo. <laughs> Redo. <laughs> yeah. Who would have guessed? <laughs> Who would have guessed? No wonder I couldn't find it. All right. Yeah. Column switcher. So I'm going to select odor. And then I'm going to select these. And so I'm going to look at the bruises, odor, population, and habitat. The other stuff is too co complicated for me. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say done. Oh, yeah. And so we're looking at odor now. Let me make this big. So I can see here that if it has a foul smell, we don't go near that, or it's creosol. I don't know if I could even distinguish creosol, but pungent, spicy, or fishy. Look at that. So That's good. I wouldn't want to eat a fishy smelling mushroom anyway. <laughs> so we have to look for none. So I hope our, our noses are in good shape. <laughs> well, if it smells like almond or anise, I think we're in good shape too. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, all right. So if we look at population, if it, there's a, several of them, we don't want to go near that. Okay. <laughs> so we want abundant. If they're abundant. So what's the difference Pete, between abundant and several? I think we better pay attention to that. Several must mean just a few. And yeah. anyhow, um, I think it's abundant cluster or numerous. So you, you got that? You're going to remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So if they're abundant or numerous, whatever the, that is but those yeah. are both good got it okay habitat all right so we know if they're along the path do not stop and smell or eat the mushroom <laughs> gotcha we we want them growing in trash and smelling yep. like almonds i think yep, there we no go. problem <laughs> no problem i think we got that covered but you know um pete what's this what's this little box here Oh, well, why don't you hit the play button there uh, up yeah. above it? Yeah. yeah. And then hit the, the box below it. So I'm what, what you did. I get a little dizzy. This is yeah. the, the speed button. Yeah. So it, it'll right. go through slower. And now if you hit the little red button underneath, it's going to start recording. And once it's sort of cycled through them all, you can hit stop and save oh and it saves the recording so let me uh stop this that way if we can save the recording we can put it on our phones and we can carry it with us yes. and have it animate when we have questions that's that sounds perfect so i think i'm just gonna put it at my desktop and oh here we go oh perfect Perfect. So, so let me um, just close this. So what we did under the red triangle, it was under redo column switcher and it allows me to step through my axes and switch the columns. Yes. Oh, and I wonder, okay. And it even, we can even use it for other things to switch. Now one yeah. note, just in case you have a Mac Pete, um, I heard somebody talk about the Macs and you don't have the animated GIFs, so it's only a PC feature. That's, yeah. But Luckily, I have, I have one of both, so that's, that's good. Uh, good to know. A, I have an idea. Ready? Why don't we go to the supermarket, buy some dirty mushrooms, put them in a bucket, and say, look what we found. That seems much safer to me. <laughs> well, this is our tip and trick for column switcher and uh creating an animated gif and uh so thanks pete and uh, let's keep a secret to ourselves and let's enjoy our barbecue tonight yes back to you julian thank you thanks so much pete and mary hope you enjoy whatever mushrooms you find while you're eating barbecue not at a barbecue uh just a reminder you can always check, catch up on all your missed segments at community.jump.com slash jump on air there you can watch the on-demand recordings and you can interact with all of our guests ask questions download any materials that they mention community.jump.com slash jump on air uh just a reminder to follow us on all of our social media channels we share often and we have lots to share so find us there reminder that next 
week is again a Monday and Friday week because we have a data visualization episode on Monday and we have a predictive modeling episode on Friday. So they're going to prove to be really great episodes. And we hope you join us on Wednesday at Stat Speaking, where we have statistical discovery in modern quality engineering. Jump.com slash Stat Speaking to register for that event Wednesday from 1 to 3. We hope you join us Monday, but until then, we hope you stay safe. We hope you stay healthy. We hope you're staying close, even as you're keeping a distance. Happy Friday, everyone. We'll see you on Monday.